Hello and welcome. I hope you're doing well. Come and get cozy as I share with you some absolutely terrifying encounters. I post new videos every day, so be sure to hit that subscribe button and the notification bell, and you'll be notified when new daily content arrives on my channel. All right, let's get right into it. To be honest, the only reason I'm able to tell you this is because I've read enough books to believe that more people than I'd realized have had strange encounters just like mine. The one thing most of their stories have in common is that they've been changed by what they've seen. I know I was. I think part of the change is acknowledging that you're not the invincible person that you thought you were. I mean, I used to go out and not be afraid of anything, and I have to admit, I was kind of proud of that persona. I was the brave mountaineer who could see my way through anything. It was a kind of pride, and I was hard on my climbing partners, overly critical. But after all this happened, I don't climb anymore, and I try to be kinder now, more tolerant. But let me tell you why I don't climb. Bear with me, as it's a long story. Ever since I was a kid, I had the urge to climb things. It all started out with an interest in insects, believe it or not. When I was little, I would collect bugs and study them. My greatest treasure was a microscope that my parents had got me when I was about six. Well, I lived in the Sierras, so my bug hunting usually involved climbing a hill or two or even occasionally small cliffs. As time went on, I would go further and further afield, climbing more and more until by the time I was in high school, I was climbing mountains with friends for the sake of the climbing itself, not to find bugs. Well, my mom had high hopes that I would go to college and get a degree and teach at a university. I hated to disappoint her, but I gradually lost my interest in bugs, which was replaced by wanting to do nothing but climb. Strangely enough, my interest in bugs rubbed off on one of my school buddies, and he became an entomology researcher who specialized in high-altitude insects, probably making his mom very proud. Sometimes, if I saw an unusual bug when I was out climbing, I would catch it and send it to him for his collection. He would actually sometimes cite me in his papers as a research partner, which was pretty generous. I would always show these to my mom, which was kind of pathetic in retrospect. But I ended up becoming a carpenter, which fit pretty well with my desire to climb, as I could work as I saw fit, as opposed to having a full-time job I had to go to every day. My sister became a community college teacher, which kind of assuaged my mom's desire for her kids to amount to something, at least by her standard. I never talked about my climbing to my family, and I doubt if they had any idea that I was eventually considered a top climber, with a number of first ascents. I knew that my climbing worried my parents, so I just never talked about it, even though it was all I lived for, and almost every extra penny I made went to finance my climb, although I did buy an old house and started working on it. I had a couple of climbing partners depending on who could get away and when, but I liked climbing with my good friend Chris the best. Chris was actually one of my old high school buddies, and we'd been climbing together for years. Like me, Chris was a low achiever when it came to employment, working odd jobs and whatever he could find when he wasn't out on the mountains. He was what we called a dirtbag, someone who sacrifices everything for their passion, and he lived in his old VW bus, though he sometimes slept in my enclosed porch when the weather got bad. I technically wasn't a dirtbag because I was self-employed and had a house that I could return to after each climb. I'd bought it for almost nothing and fixed it up as time went along, though it sure wasn't fancy. This house was in Missoula, Montana, where Chris and I had moved when we were younger, as it seemed like a good central base for climbing in the U.S. and Canadian Rockies. Chris was pretty well known in the climbing world, much more so than I was. He had actually even been featured in a few climbing magazines. Our styles were different, which is part of what made us good partners. He was somewhat serendipitous, and I was very methodical. Well, Chris and I may not have been particularly ambitious in the corporate sense of the word, but we sure were when it came to climbing and peak bagging. We decided 
it would be a worthy goal to climb all 10 of the highest peaks in North America. This was a pretty big goal, just based on what it would cost us to get to them, let alone the effort and skill it would take to actually climb them. We would climbed to Denali and Foraker, the highest and sixth highest, when we decided we were ready for the second highest, which is Mount Logan in Canada, in Yukon Territory to be specific. Logan stands at 19,551 feet, only 759 feet shorter than Denali, and is also second in North America after Denali for prominence, which is the distance from base to top. Compared to Denali, Mount Logan is not a real difficult mountain to climb, other than the preparation and necessary stamina. You do need to be well practiced in crevasse rescue though, because the mountain is surrounded by big glaciers full of treacherous crevasses. It's not a technical climb, but you won't see as many people up there like on Denali because Logan's fairly inaccessible. Logan's very isolated, cold, high, and get really crazy weather any time of the year as storms can come off the Gulf of Alaska and bring major blizzards even in the summer. I read somewhere that the weather on Mount Logan made the weather on Denali look like a summer breeze. Denali's famous for its bad weather, so that was really saying something. We'd flown into Anchorage the time we climbed Denali and Foraker, but because we were both pretty broke, we decided to try to save money by driving up to the Yukon from Montana. To make a long story short, it took us almost three weeks to get there, one of which was spent sitting in Whitehorse waiting for parts to arrive. Chris's bug broke down twice, and I swear it couldn't go over 50 miles per hour without shaking, and every time he turned it off, I worried that it wouldn't start again. We finally left Whitehorse, drove through the little village of Haynes Junction, then got to Colleen Lake, one of the most beautiful places ever, with white-topped St. Elias Range, which holds Mount Logan, towering above the lake to the west. We stopped at a pullover and had lunch, neither of us saying a word. We knew we were in for the climb of a lifetime. We couldn't see Logan from where we were, but we knew it was back there somewhere, the crown jewel of the Kulain National Park and Reserve. Because it's in the southeast corner of the park, far from any trailhead or road, few people have ever seen it, as it's a good two-day hike to get to where it's even visible. Of course, you can fly over it, but that's not the same, for you don't capture the wild feeling you get by actually being there. Had the border been drawn a few more miles to the east, the mountain would have been in the United States. The Logan Massif is the world's largest ice sheet that's not part of an ice cap. It's a huge plateau with a dozen peaks rising from it, with ridges and summits that have never been climbed. The largest mountain in the world by base circumference. The other peaks bear names like Teddy Peak, Queen Peak, King's Peak, Canternary Peak, and Prospector's Peak. The climb to the top of Logan can be a two to three week undertaking from the base to the summit and longer if you have to sit out bad weather. Some people have taken a month to climb it. Anyway, while we were sitting at the rest area, a guy on a road bike came riding up. He was from Bulgaria and was riding all the way from Fairbanks to Argentina. We gave him some water and he told us about being chased on his bike by a grizzly bear right down the middle of the highway only a few miles back. His face was still flushed and he kept looking up the road. It kind of brought home that we were truly in wild country. Chris and I finally left the rest area, following the highway along the shore of the huge lake, finally coming to the small settlement of Burwash Landing, where we could charter a plane. We talked to the charter company a few weeks before, and they'd said we didn't need a reservation as things were pretty slow. We'd been afraid to make a commitment the way things were going with the bus, as we had no idea when we would arrive. Well, come to find out, it was a good thing we hadn't made a reservation because we'd totally forgotten to stop in Haynes Junction to pick up our climbing permit. We turned around. Chris was laughing, taking it as just another element of our grand adventure, whereas I was a bit more somber. It seemed like a lot had gone wrong already, and I wondered what was to come. I hoped our bad luck would end once we got to the mountain. We were soon in Haynes Junction at the headquarters of for the Kulain National Park and Reserve. The building was reminiscent of most Forest Service buildings I'd seen in the United States. But since it was Sunday, it was closed, something else we hadn't anticipated. Because it sat back on the edge of town and was fairly private, Chris and I decided to just sleep there in his bus in the parking lot. 
it helped that there was a little bakery right across the street where we could get coffee and lunch. As we sat there in the bus eating blueberry pie, the bakery specialty, we decided on a change of plans. We would pick up our climbing permit, which we had to apply for three months before our arrival, part of the reason we'd forgotten about it. Then charter a bush plane there in Haynes Junction instead of going all the way back to Burwash Landing. At this point, we just wanted to be on the flanks of Logan. We were burning through our money, what with fixing the old bus and taking so long, so we wanted to get to our destination before anything else went wrong. I had deeper pockets than Chris and had paid the $600 it had cost to fix the bus, and I was despairing of ever getting to our destination. That late June night, there in the parking lot surrounded by trees and quiet, was one of the nicest nights I've ever spent in a town. Granted, Haynes Junction is pretty small, but I think part of the ambiance I felt was from knowing that the old bus had finally gotten us there. If I'd had any idea what was to come, I probably would have been awake all night, but we both slept well, then went inside in the morning and got our climbing permit. We also had to buy wilderness backcountry permits as well as pay an aircraft landing fee, but none of it added up to a lot. The real cost would be in chartering the plane, which we finally scheduled. We would fly out the next day. We had quite a few questions for the rangers there, and they told us a lot about the mountain and the previous climb, but the one thing that struck us as odd was when one of them told us not to cash food. It seemed that this season, something had been eating everyone's caches, putting a number of climbers in tricky situations. Without provision, we would have to carry everything we needed with us or risk losing it. At Denali, we had the folks at Talkeetna Air Charter drop a cache for us at 14,400 foot camp so we wouldn't have to carry it up, which had been an immense help, even though with just the two of us, we didn't need as many supplies as a big expedition. We hoped to do something similar here so this was bad news. We would just have to climb as fast as we could and be careful so we wouldn't run out of food. Who'd be low enough to steal someone's cash, I asked. We don't know, the ranger explained. As you know, a climber will only dip into someone else's cash in an emergency, when it's life or death. But so far this season, every time someone leaves a cash, it disappeared. And not just part of it, but the entire thing. Vanished, with no trace. We've had to make several emergency rescues because of this. If you find out who's doing it, we would love to know. Could it be a bear? Chris asked. It's highly unlikely, as bears on Logan are unheard of. It's just too high and extreme for most animals, even marmots, who steal food but not an entire cache. And all animals will leave trash behind when they steal food. Chris and I discussed this later, deciding it had to be a bear, regardless of what the rangers thought. We heard of bears at high altitude, though Logan would be an extreme. If a bear managed to climb high enough and found a cache, it might be like to just hang around there if there were more to be found. Maybe it had a secret hiding place where it would rummage through everything and leave the trash. It could end up staying there until the climbing season was over, which was usually by the end of July, then head back down. And as I thought more about it, I recalled reading a book where an Alaskan bush pilot had said he'd seen wolves, grizzly, lynx, and black bears at altitudes of 10,000 feet. Who knows, maybe they weren't even higher. The pilot had also said he'd seen ravens riding thermals at 17,000 feet, and ravens were notorious for stealing food, though they usually left a mess of wrappers. Chris and I both knew that the bear in the high expanse of snow and glacial ice and crevasses, Logan wasn't bear's play as mountains go, even experienced Himalayan climbers were impressed by Logan, saying they thought they'd seen gigantic peaks until they had their first glimpse of the massive. For a bear to even climb up there would be pretty much unthinkable, and why would it even want to? We had an entire day to kill before flying in, so we basically just hung around town talking to people at the local gear shop and trying to find out more about the mountain. I was glad we'd gone to the shop because they talked us into buying a toboggan or glacier sled, which made transporting our gear much easier. As with everything else, I paid for it. I could pull the sled and ease a lot of the load from my pack. Plus, we could stock up on more supplies, making the trip ultimately safer. Chris was ambivalent about the purchase, and I knew he was worrying about money. Even though I ended up moaning bitterly about having to drag the sled, I was ultimately glad I'd bought it. We ended up in the local bar that night against my wishes, but Chris wanted to celebrate getting this far. 
I told him we would celebrate when we got back off the mountain, but he was the kind of guy who didn't need much to justify a good brew. I noted ironically that he wasn't all that worried about spending his cash on alcohol, and the last thing I wanted was a climbing partner with a hangover, but I also didn't want to spoil his fun, so I begrudgingly went along, figuring it would be better than sitting alone in the old bus. I like a nice cold beer myself, but not when I'm getting ready to climb. Besides, I knew Chris would get hammered, as he always did. But that's where I met Kim. She was a part of a group of five Canadians who were also going to start up Logan the next day. Like me, she looked like she would rather be somewhere else than a bar, maybe reading a book. We really hit it off. She was from Edmonton and was small and light, yet looked like someone who could easily pull her own weight. She had a warmth that really made one feel at ease. She told me she was a nurse, and her fellow climbers worked at the same hospital she did. Two were doctors, one was a lab technician, and another was a fellow nurse. She was the only woman on the expedition, and I could tell that her fellow team members thought highly of her. Well, it was getting late, and even though I was enjoying talking to Kim, it was time to drag Chris back to the bus and get some sleep. He was out the minute he hit his sleeping bag. I couldn't sleep. At first, I thought about Kim and how nice she was. Then I started thinking again about all the problems that had plagued this trip. Like I said earlier, Chris and I had been climbing partners since high school, but this entire trip, it seemed like our relationship was souring a bit, and I wasn't sure why. Both of us had had been out of sorts and snappy since we'd left Montana, and his bus breaking down hadn't helped things. When I would complain, he would snap right back saying he'd supplied the transportation, as unreliable as it was. I reminded him that I was paying the gas, which was much more than I'd planned as the bus was a gas hog. At one point, I was ready to turn around and go back, but we finally managed to patch things up. Now, as Chris snored next to me, reeking of alcohol, I made a decision. This would be our last climb together. It seemed that we both turned into grouchy old men, even though we were both only in our 40s. But for climbers, we were getting long in the tooth. I was again thinking about Kim, and I decided I would try to get her address if we met again on the mountain, assuming she was single. I must be getting old, I mused. If the thought of climbing took second place to getting a woman's phone number, maybe I was ready to settle down. I had the feeling Chris was also burning out. After all, we'd made a good run at things, so why not retire from the big peaks and enjoy something else, something not so dangerous? Maybe trying to climb the top 10 peaks was too ambitious. I'd always wanted to build my own cabin up in the Sierras. Maybe I'd sell the Montana house and go do that. Go back home. I knew my parents would like that. And they were getting elderly. As I lay there, sleepless, my mind drifted to the first winter expedition on Denali in 1967. Still called McKinley at the time. The eight-man expedition had lost one member to a crevasse and had been plagued with bad weather and marginal choices, even though it had successfully put three of the group on the summit. Those three had spent over a week in a small snow cave at 18,000 feet in a 150 mile per hour wind with wind chills of nearly minus 150 degrees. With only enough food for two days, most of the team had suffered frostbite. Some serious and a helicopter rescue had been necessary because of the frostbite and more incoming bad weather, even though they'd managed to get partway back down once the weather broke. It struck me the only reason the three near the top had survived was because they'd managed to dig into a frozen cache where they found enough food to carry them over until the wind died down. They had literally been starving until they found it. The leader, highly experienced and a strong climber, had later told the other team members that he'd been distracted and hadn't done his best, even though no one blamed him for what had been a series of mostly bad luck circumstances. But he told them that all he could think about during the expedition was getting back home where his priorities had changed. There in the bus, I could feel the same kind of change. Maybe I should cancel tomorrow. Tell Chris I didn't want to do the climb and go home. If I was going to climb Logan, I wanted to do my best. And right now, I wasn't feeling very enthusiastic. I wasn't the leader of our little two-man expedition. Neither of us was. But I somehow felt partly responsible for Chris. I then realized that what I was feeling was resentment. I'd always been the more responsible one. The one who worked hard and thereby had a porch for Chris to sleep on. The one who always had more money to pay for things. Maybe I'd internalized my parents' values more than I realized, but I was beginning to feel that Chris took advantage of me and always had, 
I'd known this, of course, but this trip was really bringing it to the forefront of my thoughts, and I was tired after all these years. I knew Chris would be angry if I bailed, but he might be able to sign on with Kim's group. They'd seemed to take to one another at the bar, and Chris was a good-natured guy with top-notch experience. He would be a great asset to any climbing party. I could hitch a ride back to Whitehorse and fly home. I would leave Chris enough gas money to get back, since that was part of the deal. I finally drifted off in peace, deciding I wouldn't climb Logan after all. It seemed the perfect solution to my worries. And as I drifted off, I wondered again who or what was stealing the caches. Of course, the next morning, I was back to my old self, all worries gone, excited to make the trip, hoping to meet Kim on the trail. Chris was hungover, but he always recovered, though I noticed as he aged, it seemed to take longer and he grumbled more. In another twist of irony, after we'd confirmed and paid for the air charter, we found out the airport was near Burwash Landing, where we'd just been, but now would have to pay for a shuttle from Haynes Junction. More cash out the window. My cash. But we were soon in the air, and after a while, we could see the Logan Massif in the distance. It soared far above the surrounding glaciers and peaks, seeming to completely occupy the horizon, even from a long ways off. It looked surreal, beautiful, and intimidating, and very stark and lonely. The yellow Helio Courier set us down at Mount Logan Base Camp on the Quintino Stella Glacier at about 9,000 feet. We were now on a vast white expanse of snow at King's Trench, named for the nearby 16,972-foot King's Peak, the ninth tallest mountain in North America. The King's Trench route ascends the west side of Logan and is non-technical and one can ski most of its large glacier system, though it's interlaced with crevasses and avalanche danger. Like most climbers, we would follow the trench, climb to the great plateau where the summit block stood, then make our way to the top. Hopefully, anyway. We landed not too far from Kim and her friends. We unloaded our gear, and I carefully lashed part of it onto the sled. I thought that maybe we would take turns pulling it, but Chris refused to put any of his gear on it, saying it was going to be a nuisance. I was again irritated but said nothing, putting on my skis, knowing that he would be happy to eat some of the extra food on the sled when the need arose. Since it was early, we decided to head out and hopefully make good time. Most people stay at least one night at the base camp to help acclimate, but we wanted to get going, to get as far as we could in case we were later plagued with some bad weather the Mastiff was famous for. We had left Kim's group in the dust, so to speak, and we camped that night under a rocked ridge, tired but happy. Chris wanted to try to get to King's Trench Camp only 2,000 feet above, but I'd argued that we'd be better off taking it easy and just going a short distance, getting our legs under us, so to speak. Besides getting all the way to King's Trench Camp meant crossing a field of crevasse danger, and I wanted to cross it early in the morning when the light was better and one could maybe make out places where the snow was thinner, potentially hiding crevasses. We pitched our two-man tent, then I set up our little stove and boiled water, which seemed to take forever at that altitude. We had a dinner of freeze-dried stew with raisins, followed by cups of hot jello, then glops of peanut butter and dark chocolate, all melted together in hot black tea. It was imperative to drink lots of fluid so we didn't get dehydrated, for at those altitudes, one tended to not get thirsty even though your body still needed plenty of water. Finally satiated, Chris and I now kicked back our sleeping pads under us, leaning against our tent and watching a fiery sunset down on King's Trench. It was 11 p.m., and even though it was midsummer, we were far enough north that the sky never really did get dark. I finally went to bed, all our gear pulled up into the tent's vestibule, with the toboggan stuck into the snow, serving as kind of a door. I thought again of something stealing caches, but I couldn't begin to imagine what could exist on this vast white whiteness of snow and ice. It was beginning to get light again at 4 a.m., and even though I wasn't completely rested, I was up and about, melting more snow for water. We were soon moving, Chris breaking trail with his skis and me following along, the ends of my skis getting bound up in the toboggan line and even slamming against the front edge of the sled at times. It was frustrating, but I refused to say anything to Chris, as I didn't want him to think he'd been right. In a way, the sled made things easier as it took the weight off my back, and also allowed us to bring more supplies, but it seemed I was always getting tangled up in it. I'd heard of people's sleds getting free and taking off down the mountain, 
so I also carried my pack, keeping everything I needed for survival in it, like my sleeping bag and the stove and the fuel. Even though it was only the second day, the whole thing was already beginning to feel like an endless slog. We were now going slower, knowing it was critically important to acclimate to the altitude. Neither of us had any of the many disorders that go with high-altitude climbing, such as pulmonary edema, but we'd known of others who hadn't made it back off the mountain. We figured it would take us about 10 days to get to the actual summit if all went well and the weather was perfect, and part of that had to be spent acclimating, letting our bodies get used to the lack of oxygen. At this point, we were roped together, well aware of the crevasse dangers, taking it slow and easy. That evening, we made it to the King's Trench camp, much more fatigued than we'd anticipated. We both climbed lots of 14,000-foot peaks in Colorado, yet this felt different, even though we were only at 11,000 feet. Everything seemed much more difficult, and I knew it was from the bitter cold, a minus 10 degrees Fahrenheit by Chris's thermometer. I could imagine how cold it must get up there in the winter. I once again got out the stove and started melting snow. But just as the water started to boil, Chris took the pan and tossed it into the air. What are you doing? I asked, irritated. Look, buckaroo, it froze instantly. Hey, take a picture, he demanded. Ever since I'd spent a summer in my youth working on a ranch in Colorado, so I could climb there, Chris had called me buckaroo, even though I'd never been on a horse. I was now laughing. We had plenty of fuel, so I heated another pan of snow and Chris threw it into the air as I took the photo. The water freezing instantly in the sub-zero temperature. I still have that photo, and it's the strangest thing ever. There's Chris, grinning, pot in hand, King's Peak towering in the background, and in front of him is a long, sinuous thing that looks like a giant hot dog with hundreds of spears of ice sticking out everywhere. This changed the mood for the better, and Chris and I joked around after that, seemingly back to how things used to be. We pulled out cigars and sat puffing on them, even though neither of us were smokers. It was a ritual to celebrate making it as far as we had. But in retrospect, things hadn't really changed. They just lightened up for a while. We spent our third day resting, tired and trying to acclimate, half expecting to see Kim's team show up at any time. We didn't understand why they hadn't caught up to us. I realized later that they stayed put at base camp for a while to organize everything and acclimate. They were from the Alberta Prairie and not as used to the altitude as we were. Plus, it takes longer to get a larger group like that organized and moving. Instead of Kim's group, what showed up was the wind. A major storm appeared to be coming in, and we knew this could shut us down for some time. These things were virtually impossible to predict, for they rose quickly and unexpectedly from the other side of the mountain in the Gulf of Alaska and swept across to the east, catching up more wind and snow on the way, growing in intensity. We dragged everything back into the vestibule again, using the sled as a sort of door, cramming its tail into the snow it actually worked pretty effectively, although some of the snow still blew in. We were happy for the zipped door between us and the vestibule as the wind shook the tent, howling and moaning. The snow wall we'd built around the tent helped keep it from getting buried. It was now around midnight when we heard voices. At first I thought it was my imagination, then I thought it was a plane. Hey Chris, listen, I said. Hear the plane? Do you think it's coming in to rescue someone? Chris replied, don't be silly, it's the wind. A plane could never land in these conditions. I listened. It was indeed the wind, but I swore I could hear voices. Finally, there was no denying it. Someone was shouting over the wind. It appeared that Kim's group had finally caught up with us. We were both happy for the company, leaving our tent and warm sleeping bags to help them set up their tents and get settled in. They'd been caught in the blizzard and would have been lost if they hadn't been able to find their way with the map and GPS. They were very happy to see us. It was a long night, and the next day was even longer, as the wind, instead of letting up, seemed to blow harder. I was afraid to leave the tent as I thought it would blow away without my weight holding it down. Chris felt the same way, so we took turns going out, though we tried not to go out at all. We didn't see much of the other group, as everyone else was hunkered down. I was glad for all the extra food, for this was exactly the kind of thing I knew could happen from all the stories I read about climbing Mount Logan. The northern peaks are always like this, with erratic and unpredictable storms brewing. Mindful of keeping my pack as light as possible, I'd brought one single book for such an occasion, as had Chris. Mine was John McPhee's Annals of the Former World, a long tome on the geology of the U.S. 
and Chris had brought Mark Twain's Roughing It. We picked the book based on length, wanting something that would last for many hours if we found ourselves in a situation like the one we were currently in. We read and read, switching sides, stretching, making tea, curling up, and after we'd each finished our book, we traded and kept reading. After the second day of the storm, now our fifth day on the mountain, we started reading passages aloud to each other and commenting on them as if we were in an English lit class. Finally bored, I got out my notebook and started sketching pictures of pizza, steaks, and whatever delicious food I could think of. We'd only barely started out and I was already craving comfort food. I'd heard of climbers losing a pound or more a day on high altitude climbs like this. And it felt like I'd already lost weight even just resting in the tent. The next morning, we again heard voices, and the unnatural quiet told us the storm had passed through. Kim's group was now up and around, and we got up excitedly, packing up our gear ready to continue. The other group had set up a cooking tent, and it had been blown several hundred yards down the trench. They ran down and retrieved it, and I remarked to Chris that I felt that they were being extremely careless to not rope up, as the whole area was a crevasse field. In retrospect, the carelessness was a red flag, but I ignored it. The skies were still stormy, looking, the tail end of the storm passing through. The few extra days had helped us acclimate, and Chris and I both felt good. Our differences now seemed minor. Everything negative seemed to have dissipated with the storm. I was soon again wrestling with the toboggan, even though it was now a few pounds lighter from our stay in the tent. No matter what I did, it was impossible to keep its lines from catching in my ski poles, which was very frustrating. I thought about abandoning it, but I decided that carrying all that weight on my back would soon get more tiresome than wrestling with the poles. I finally stopped and redistributed the weight on the sled, putting the heavy stuff on the bottom and the light stuff on top, which helped some. The storm had now cleared out, leaving skies filled with ice crystals. It was hard to breathe, but it was incredibly beautiful, making everything look like a snow globe. We trudged on, again having outpaced Kim's group, though we could see them as small shapes against the horizon behind us. Because there were only two of us, we were capable of making much better time, but I also suspected we were in better shape having climbed a lot. It was a beautiful day and we finally stopped to make lunch and take a break. I stepped off a few feet to take a leak when I saw a trackway cutting at a 90 degree angle from the trench going to the side. This puzzled me. Why would someone be going across King's Trench? Were they going to climb one of the lower peaks? I carefully walked over to look at the track, but it was hard to tell much except they seemed exceedingly deep. Whoever it was had neither snowshoes nor ski, and yet they still managed to have a stride of nearly three feet between each step. I found this incredible. The trackway stretched as far as the eye could see, disappearing in the cliff. I called Chris over to take a look, and he too was puzzled. It just seemed so unlikely, and why only one set of tracks? Why perpendicular to us and not parallel? I thought of an Argentinian woman, 37 years old, Natalia Martinez, who tried to solo the peak and been caught in a huge earthquake, necessitating a rescue, but it was rare to solo Logan. Besides, one didn't solo Logan by climbing the wrong direction. It was just too weird. It was then that Kim's team finally caught up with us. Either we slowed down or they were getting their stride, maybe both. I was actually happy for this, as it would make things safer to have more people roped together when we crossed the crevasse field. It was always easier to rescue someone with more people, especially when it came to dragging someone out of a crevasse. I didn't know it, but my thoughts would soon become prophetic. I thought about the nature of being rescued on Logan as opposed to Denali. Even though the climb on Logan is similar to Denali, in its character, Logan is much more remote and isolated. In contrast, Denali has a peak service ranger patrol, endless plane traffic, and hundreds of climbers at camp, and even though this can be frustrating, it makes for a safer climb. Logan had none of this. When Kim's crew caught up with us, I showed them the tracks. One of the guys laughed, remarked that the Yeti had found its way to North America, and they all joked about this for a while, but I noticed Kim looked pretty serious. She began asking questions the rest of us hadn't considered. Had someone become disoriented and stumbled off the trail, maybe then the blizzard? Should we follow the tracks and see if they needed help? Her group had a satellite phone and decided to call out and tell park rangers about what we'd seen. They took GPS coordinates and relayed those, hoping the next air charter could do a flyover and check it out. 
We decided to continue forward for going off course could be very dangerous. The track stretched far across the trench, considerably out of our way. And who knew how old they were? We now trudged on together, hoping to get to King's Coal Camp at 13,500 feet. King's Peak still looming above us, to our right. Eventually, we reached another crevasse field and roped up together, carefully using our ski pole to probe ahead, going slow. We wore our harnesses all the time so we didn't have to fumble while roping up in potentially dangerous places. It was fairly treacherous, but what made it really scary was that the trench itself had narrowed and we were now also in serious avalanche terrain. There was an avalanche exposure up most of the route, but we now entered a zone where we had to work our way through the rubble from previous life. The flanks of high mountains towering ominously above on both sides. No one spoke and the sound of our skis slowly swishing along gave the scene an eerie feeling. Avalanche responders and beacons were highly recommended by the park and Chris and I had ours, but I wondered about Kim's group. My thoughts then wandered to what I would do if I had to help rescue someone. I had a probe and shovel on my toboggan and my love-hate relationship with the sled turned to love, at least for a while. It typically takes two days to get from King's Trench Camp to King's Coal Camp, and once the trench widened back out and the avalanche danger lessened, we came to the consensus to make camp and try for King's Coal the next day. We gained only a thousand feet of altitude, but the next day would be relatively easy in comparison, even though we would have more avalanche exposure and another crevasse field across. In spite of being stuck in our tents for several days, we were now making good time. I helped Chris stomp down a base, build a snow wall, and pitch our tent. I did notice with concern that the tip of his nose was turning white, and he dutifully put on his face mask. His thermometer now read minus 15 degrees, cold enough for rapid frostbite. Kim's crew soon had their cook tent up and invited us to have dinner with them. They'd made a big pot of spicy chili, the exact type of food I try to avoid when climbing even though it was delicious, because food supplies are so critical on a trip like this, I felt it appropriate to contribute something back, so I dug out a frosted spice cake that a friend had made for the trip, which was a big hit. I guess Chris also felt like he needed to contribute something, so he pulled out a flask of scotch whiskey, which was an even bigger hit, at least with several members of Kim's group. I noticed she didn't partake, nor did I. I was furious, but I said nothing. Alcohol and cold and high altitudes are a recipe for disaster, and Chris knew it as well as anyone, if not better. I knew that anyone who drank Chris's whiskey could potentially have their judgment and stamina affected the next day, impacting us all. And drinking alcohol can actually help bring on hypothermia, since alcohol causes the blood vessels to open up, causing the body to cool. Chris became his typical jovial self when drinking, and he sat next to Kim telling her all about our expedition to Denali in more detail than she probably cared to hear. To me, it seemed like he was bragging. I said goodnight to everyone, even though it was still early, and crawled into the tent. My irritation with Chris now burned, not just because of the alcohol, which I knew would slow him down the next day, but also because he seemed to be arrogant in talking about his climb. At least, that's what I thought my irritation was from but maybe it was just part of the earlier ongoing disenchantment I was having with our friendship. I wrote for a bit in my journal, did a sketch of King's Peak, and finally went to bed. I was tired, and the altitude was bothering me a little, but nothing serious. I just felt more fatigued than I should have. I didn't even wake up when Chris came in, at least not until he started snoring like a freight train. I'd camped with Chris many times, and I knew this snoring was all the result of alcohol. After I bluntly told him to shut up a few times, he finally turned over and seemed to fall into a deep sleep. It was as dark as it gets up north on a summer night, so I figured it must be about 2 a.m. when Chris started talking in sleep, waking me. This was new. Chris never talked in his sleep, but I could hear him clear as day, though I couldn't quite make out what he was saying. It seemed as if he somehow gotten inside my head and was talking gibberish. I was probably more angry than I should have been, and was pretty vehement about telling him to shut up, adding a few choice swear words for emphasis. Chris was now awake, sitting up as something was scraping against the tent. There was something in the vestibule. My first thought went to something stealing the cash, and I quickly snapped on my headlamp. There was no way I was going to let our food be stolen. I yelled like a pirate at the top of my lungs, thinking it was probably a bear, and I would scare it away. Chris seemed totally confused and befuddled, holding his hands up against the glare of my headlamp. 
I unzipped the door that led into the vestibule, shining my light all around, but if anything had been there, it was gone, as was my sled and Chris's pack. I slipped on my heavy parka and boots and stepped outside, shining my light everywhere, frantic. The sled had almost all our food, and without it, we'd have to borrow Kim's sat phone and call for an early pickup. I flashed my light all around until I finally saw the sled a good 20 feet from the tent. I ran to it, barely grabbing it. A few moments more, and it would have been gone, as it was sliding down the hill, slowly gaining speed. I dragged it back to the tent and secured it in the vestibule, crawling back inside, noting that Chris had grabbed his pack and pulled it inside the tent. Chris asked what had happened, but I had no answers. He then said the sled had probably been pushed out of the vestibule by the wind, maybe dragging the pack along with it. I was once again angry, for Chris apparently hadn't secured the sled properly when he'd come into the tent after I'd gone to sleep. He'd probably been tipsy, and if I hadn't heard him talking in his sleep, the sled would have been long gone, as would have been our chance at climbing Logan. This was exactly the kind of carelessness I'd been worried about earlier. It took me a long time to get back to sleep. We continued on the next day, neither of us mentioning the incident of the previous night, but Chris seemed quieter than usual. Kim's group had again camped with us, but as usual, we were far ahead of them by the time they got up and around. From now on, the scenery around us became more and more stunning. The climbs between camps became more and more arduous. We would undoubtedly reach King's Cole Camp by evening, but the upcoming stretch was really hairy, replete with both avalanche and crevasse danger almost the entire way. We debated whether or not to wait for Kim's group so we could all rope up together, but then decided we were getting behind schedule and should just keep going. They didn't have the experience we did, but they knew enough about crevasse by that time to know what to do and what not to do. We hadn't signed on to guide anyone, and we were both getting anxious to make the summit. But it was only a matter of half an hour or less when we could hear shouts coming from below. I always carry a small monocular as I glass down the slope towards our last camp, I could see Kim's group and one of them was waving what looked to be a red parka. My heart sank, for I could see two others of the group on their stomach looking into what appeared to be a long black line in the slope. A crevasse. In the snow. I counted the people, and sure enough, there were only four. It appeared someone had fallen in. We just roped through the crevasse field ourselves, and the thought of going back through it again wasn't pleasant. But I felt we had no choice. We had to go back. Both Chris and I had extensive experience in crevasse rescues, and I was sure they would need our help. Chris wanted to leave our pack and the sled where we'd stop so we could make better time down, but I insisted we take them with us. Who knew if we would be back up there, and our lives would depend on having our gear. I was surprised at how quickly we made it back down, following our track, which was encouraging. I'd heard one could ski from the summit to the base camp in a day if they were good skiers, and this confirmed that it might be possible. I was shocked at what we found. Just like when they'd gone for the camp tent, no one had bothered to rope up, even though they knew they were traversing a crevasse field. I'd seen the first incident as a red flag, and I now knew I was right. Their group didn't belong on the mountain. They were being so careless. The very fact that they would partake in Chris's alcohol had confirmed that, but this made it even clearer. Someone was down in the crevasse with no rope, which was going to make a rescue extremely difficult. I wasn't sure exactly who it was, except I knew it wasn't Kim for she seemed to be the only one calm enough to be trying to organize a rescue. I just hoped we wouldn't be recovering a body at that point. Chris and I assessed the situation, then decided one of us would go down on a rope and see if the person, a guy named Kurt, was still even alive, and then decide what to do from there. I thought again of Chris drinking the previous night and decided I would have to be the one to go. Frankly, I didn't trust him to get the job done, knowing he wasn't at his best. We soon had a rope set, and I went over the edge. Kurt was only about 25 feet down and had luckily managed to catch his pack on a wedge of ice, which was all that was holding him in place. I knew I had to quickly get a rope around him before the pack straps gave out. They were also cutting into his chest and making it difficult for him to breathe. Because he wasn't down all that far and was basically unhurt, it was a relatively straightforward rescue. He was wearing his harness, which made things easier, and I soon had him roped up. The group above hoisted him up and then I jumared my way up, and that was that. We all stood around for a moment, saying nothing, then everyone silently roped up and we returned to trudging upward, arriving at the 13,500-foot King's Cole Camp later that afternoon. Everyone was really quiet that night and went to bed early. I think they knew what I was thinking, that they had no business being up there and should go back, but there was no way I was going to tell them that. 
First of all, they weren't my responsibility. And secondly, I felt that Chris had contributed to their carelessness by providing them with alcohol the previous evening. I again had trouble sleeping, probably from the altitude. As I tossed and turned, I wondered what had really happened to the sled the previous night. Even if Chris hadn't pulled it into the vestibule, there was no way it would take down the hill like that on its own because our snow wall would have stopped it. We always built a small snow barrier around the tent to keep snow from partly burying us in the night if a wind came up, and the sled would have been dragged over that before it could go anywhere. On top of that, Chris's pack was just too heavy for the sled to be able to move out on the vestibule unless a hurricane force wind had been blowing. Thinking that something or someone had tried to take our sled along with hearing what I'd assumed was Chris's voice at about the same time, well, it all left me feeling very spooked. On top of that, while we'd been trudging up the hill to King's Coal, I caught a glimpse of something in the rocks above us. It was large and covered head to toe in long black hair that blew in the wind. Hair way too long to be a bear. It must have seen me look at it, for it quickly ducked down. But even in that short time, it gave me the creep. I'd look to see if Chris had spotted it also, but he had his head down looking for crevasses as he was leading. It all seemed to fit together with something dealing caches, but it also seemed otherworldly, a feeling that was beginning to permeate this entire place. For some reason, the thought came out of nowhere. What if Chris and I had been climbing apart instead of together when the figure in the rocks appeared above us? What exactly was it? I thought it might be prudent for us to stay with Kim's group from there on out. Each camp we reached was more rewarding than the last, but the altitude was having an effect on both Chris and I. Actually, we both knew we should be acclimating better than we were as we were both now getting headaches and having shortness of breath, as well as losing our appetite, and we weren't even that high yet. That night, after a big dinner that neither of us really wanted and lots of hot tea, I decided to see what Chris was thinking. He'd been uncharacteristically quiet all day. We were both in our sleeping bags, hunkering down for the night. Chris, I said measuredly, last night I heard what I thought was you talking in your sleep, but it was odd, almost like it was in my head, and you never talk in your sleep. Plus, it was gibberish, like a monkey. Shortly after that, I heard something brush against the side of the tent, and when I looked outside, the sled was gone. In addition, your heavy pack was out of the vestibule. I paused, then added, how would you explain all that? Tell me how my sled, which I barely caught from running away down the mountain, and your heavy pack could both be outside our foot-tall snow wall. Chris shook his head in chagrin. I told you, it was the wind. It came up under the vestibule and blew everything out. We need to get a tent with a vestibule floor. A really heavy wind could blow stuff over the wall. It wasn't that tall. But there was no wind, I replied, frustrated. It was blowing when you were asleep. It woke me up, Chris replied. You obviously slept through it. It pushed everything out of the vestibule and over the wall, and then it took the sled a while before it started taking off. And you caught it just in time. Okay, I'll grant you that, but how do you explain the figure I saw up on the rock? When it saw me looking at it, it ducked down. It was coal black. It wasn't my imagination, Chris. Buckaroo, remember how we've talked about this thing called Mountain Madness? Remember the guy who reported seeing heavy road equipment near the top of Akonuga? You've heard the stories just like I have, and that's what I think you saw on that cliff. A big something that wasn't real. Mountain Madness had you in its grip for a moment. Give me a break, I replied with anger. If anyone was a bit off their rocker, it was you from too much whiskey the night before. Okay, I know that irritated you, and I'm sorry. I shouldn't have brought it with me. It's bad for hypothermia, you know that, I replied. But since Chris seemed so sincerely contrite, I let it go. Chris and I had talked about Mountain Madness a lot before, as it fascinated us. we both seen it in other climbers, as well as maybe having touches of it ourselves. It was just beginning to be recognized as a real ailment by the medical community, something separate from all the other things that can go wrong when you climb through the mountains. Though mountaineers had known about it for decades, anyone who's climbed the big peaks for long has heard of third man syndrome, a presence that provides help when things are going wrong, often by guiding lost climbers back to their camp. But there was also plenty of times when the opposite occurred, when a climber thought he was hearing voices giving him good advice that actually turned out to be potentially fatal. That affliction was primarily characterized by hallucinations, with the sufferer seeming perfectly normal in all other ways. Unlike physical elements like pulmonary and cerebral edema, mountain madness wasn't fatal, though researchers thought it might be the source of a number of inexplicable accidents and misjudgments. 
they were beginning to think it was a form of temporary high-altitude psychosis. I crawled down into my sleeping bag, muttered something to the effect of, I know what I saw, Chris, and it was real, but wondering if he might be right. It didn't make sense to see something black way up in the rock on an unnamed ridge that had probably never been climbed. But as I drifted off, I could once again see the trackway, and I was pretty sure I was sane, at least as sane as any climber could be. But I did vow, however, to be especially careful just in case I would defer any important decisions to Chris, or better yet, to Kim if she were around. The next day would be our eighth day on the mountain, and we hoped to make the next camp by dark, even though it was normally a two-day effort. We knew we were getting closer to the top with every step, and at this point we both wanted to summit and go home. Even Chris was complaining about not feeling well, and I hoped he wasn't coming down with something serious. I was actually feeling a bit better, somewhat stronger, and was now beginning to really enjoy the view. Once we got to Camp 3, which sat on 15,700 feet, the summit was within our reach just a couple of days away. We would continue and climb with Kim's group, even though they sometimes held us to a slower pace than we preferred. Every time I thought about telling Chris we should break away and go faster, I recalled the black figure in the rocks and said nothing. The whole time, we watched the sky for changes in the weather, for this would be the only thing that could stop us at this point, barring an accident. Any little wisp of cloud was a matter of much deliberation and thought, and our eyes often turned to the west, the direction from which big storms would come. The only forms of communication in the St. Ellis range are devices that rely on satellites, so we couldn't call out for weather reports. I knew that Kim's group had an expensive sat phone, but I wasn't sure if they were doing any weather tracking with it or not but I figured that they would tell us if they did know of something coming in. We were getting more and more anxious to get to the summit and back down. The whole time we climbed the trench, I looked for signs of climbers ahead of us, but I never saw any, nor did we find any caches. Kim's group had told us the rangers at Haynes Junction had said the park was talking about banning caches entirely. So that next morning, we got a really early start, and it seemed that everyone was feeling stronger. We slogged up the mountain, stopping only for quick breaks, and by midnight, to my amazement, we actually made it to Camp 3. I think everyone was feeling summit fever, knowing we were only a few days from the top. I was amazed that Kim's group had climbed so strong, and after a quick dinner, we crawled into our tent, exhausted. I noticed that Kim's group didn't even bother to set up their cook tent. Kim's group had been changed by Kurt's accident in the crevasse, and they now seemed to be taking the climb much more seriously. In fact, Kurt had become a sort of a safety patrol, always making sure everyone was buckled and tied in. Chris and I always led, having more crevasse experience, but I noticed Kurt was always right behind us, making sure all was well, maybe as a sort of penance for the trouble he'd caused. In any case, we were now climbing more like pros and less like a bunch of happy-go-lucky kids. I was happy to see this, especially since it meant Chris and I could go off the mountain at our own pace after we'd summited and not worry about them. We were both strong skiers and I hoped to be able to ski down in one day. That night, I again woke to Chris talking in the sleep, but instead of waking him, I tried to understand what he was saying. It was garbled and once again seemed to be bypassing my ears and going straight to my brain. I knew that wasn't possible and probably a sensation caused by altitude, but this time it wasn't gibberish. Now that we're close, it's very important we rest a lot, Chris said. We won't have a lot of strength, and I think it's best we leave everything at the last camp while we summit. I didn't answer, for I knew he was sound asleep, but I was once again irritated. He was saying the exact opposite of what we should really do. If we wanted to summit, we needed to set a pace and stick with it, not take breaks all the time. Every time you stop for a break, your body has to reset when you restart. Unless you're extraordinarily tired, you should just stay at a pace and keep going. But maybe Chris was right about leaving everything at the last camp. It would make things much easier, and I wouldn't be pulling this damn sled to the summit. I'd read that it typically takes about 15 hours from the summit plateau camp to the summit and back again, so there really was no need to carry all our gear to the top, as we'd be back at the camp that same day. The odds of someone stealing our cash at that altitude seemed small. When I woke early the next dawn, I could see Mount Logan towering over us. I knew we must look like tiny dark specks against the white snow to anyone on its summit. It was one of the most spectacular sights of all my mountaineering career. The mountain was completely white, 
all of its ridges and rocks outcropping completely buried in snow. And as I stood in wonder, Alpine Glow began to light its summit in subtle shades of pink. Someone was now standing by me, and I turned to see Kim. We hadn't really talked much on the entire expedition, primarily because I was usually holed up in my tent, mad at Chris over something or other. She wrapped her arm in mine in what I took as a gesture of friendship, as well from being cold. It was bitter, but I knew as soon as the sun rose over the mountains, it would warm up. The reflective surface of the snow acting like a heating source. We talked about trying to make the summit plateau camp at 17,600 feet in one day, which we both thought was quite possible, even though some people take two. There was an intermediary camp between there and Camp 4, but once one reached that, it was all downhill to Summit Plateau Camp, which sat on a plateau that rose again to the mountain top. Are you guys strong skiers? I asked. We all ski pretty well. Why do you ask? She replied. I've heard that you can ski to the bottom in one day if you're a good skier and follow your track. Chris and I are going to try. It would be good for us to all stay together. If we can get to the Summit Plateau camp today, we could be off the mountain day after tomorrow. Kim said that was a good idea, one she would mention to her group, as she knew they were getting tired and anxious to get down off the mountain. She knew they wanted to spend the day here to regroup, but she personally wanted to keep going and would try to talk them into it. The more I talked to her, the better I liked her, but I knew that even if we were to have a relationship, my living in the U.S. and her in Canada would probably pose some difficult barriers. She seemed to like me too, and as she stood there, her arm in mine, watching the alpine glow on the mountain, I felt very close to her. She then asked, are you superstitious? I felt it was a strange thing to ask, but I said, no, generally not. Why? She replied, before we decided to climb Mount Logan, I did a lot of research. I came upon several stories about people who had heard and seen strange things. They mostly wrote it off to the altitude, but it gave me pause. She continued, but last night, something was messing with my tent. It was almost as if someone was trying to pick it up. I could hear some of the guy's lines snap out of the ice. I thought it was some of the guys playing a prank, but it seemed highly unlikely as everyone was so tired. Besides, who wants to play prank at minus 20? But come, look. We walked over to her tent, where several of the guy's lines were indeed pulled out from the ice. But what was strange was that there were no tracks anywhere. No signs that anyone had been outside her tent. You're not being superstitious, Kim, I replied. We've been having odd things happen too. Something tried to steal our sled and pack. Chris said it was just the wind, but I also saw something strange. I then told her about seeing the figure in the rock. Kim replied with something that left me feeling a grave concern. You know our cook tent? There was no way it could have been blown down the mountain like that as we'd staked it deep into the ice in anticipation of high winds. I think it was tampered with. When we saw it down the mountain, we all kind of freaked out, and that's why we didn't rope it up. We'd been warned about leaving caches, so we'd taken our sled and packed into our tent, but the cook tent had our breakfast in it. When we retrieved it, everything was there, except the food. I was silent, not sure what to say, but we finally agreed we should all stay together from there on out. Chris and the rest of the group were now stirring, and we joined them, drinking hot tea and eating breakfast. We decided to try for the Summit Plateau Camp today, but if anyone got fatigued, we would stop at Camp 4. It seemed unreal to everyone that we were so close to the top. If all went well, we would be trying for the summit the next day. So far, the weather seemed to be holding up, and everyone said they felt strong and well-rested, in spite of the long day yesterday. When we got to Camp 4, everyone wanted to continue seeing it was now downhill to the summit plateau. So we kept going, now making good time. Finally tired and weary, we made it to summit plateau camp late that evening. We were excited, knowing that if all went well, we'd summit Logan the next day. Kim's group again set up the cook tent, and we had a huge dinner, partly because we wanted to celebrate, but also because we wanted to build up our reserves as much as we could for the big day tomorrow. Everyone was happy and talking, and I hoped Chris didn't have any more whiskey in his pack, because I knew he would be likely to pull it out. I found out later he did, but he decided to save it for base camp. I crawled into our tent and tried to decide whether or not to leave everything at camp or take it with me, thinking of Chris talking in his sleep, telling me to leave everything at the last camp. I felt a shiver go through me, wondering if, if I had really heard Chris talking 
or if it were something else. But I decided I would go ahead and take his advice and leave the tent and sled at the camp. But I would load my pack with enough food to get us to the summit and back down to base camp. I would also take my sleeping bag, the bivy sack I carried for emergencies, the stove and fuel, and my survival gear just in case. It would be a heavy pack, but I would have everything I needed with me. That way, if something happened to the tent and gear at the summit camp, I could still make it back down. I divvied the food up and put half of it in Chris's sleeping bag. He could make his own decision as to whether to carry it to the top or not. I then crawled into my sleeping bag and tried to sleep. I had a headache and my legs were restless and the air seemed dreadfully thin. I could hear everyone talking and laughing over by the cook tent and I wondered why they were so happy since we still had thousands of feet to go. But instead of going to sleep, I found myself thinking of my mom and dad far away in the California mountain, probably wondering if I were dead or alive, even though they were used to my shenanigans. I knew they were getting older and probably tired of worrying about me, assuming they even still did. I finally took a sleeping pill as a last resort and was soon out. I woke around 3 a.m. noting that Chris had put the extra food in his pack after I'd gone to sleep. I crawled out of the tent and started melting snow on the little stove, Chris still asleep. I was soon dressed and ready to go. I still wasn't hungry and had a headache, but I was eager to get going, irritated that the others were asleep. I thought about going alone, but decided I would wait for Chris, restless as I was. I stomped around for a while, trying to get warm, then finally started singing taps at the top of my lungs, then shouting stupid things like rise and shine. I felt justified in waking everyone as it was summit day and we had a long trek ahead of us. I thought I would feel more excited than I did, but all I really wanted was to get it over with and get back to camp. Everyone was finally up, irritated with me, but also anxious to summit. One of Kim's group pulled me aside at breakfast to tell me they'd called out on their sat phone for a weather report and had been told a big front was coming in and was expected to hit within 48 hours, maybe less. He said his group had decided to go ahead and summit, but he wanted to make sure that Chris and I knew about the storm. If we could summit and get back to camp by dark, we could ski out the next day and hopefully beat the bad weather. Even if we had to hunker down at base camp for a few days, we'd be fine until a plane could come and get us. We were soon on our way again. The movement warmed up both my body and mind and I began to feel a sense of exhilaration. Our goal was so close. Typically, the day you summit a big peak is usually the hardest as you're fatigued and at the highest altitude, but this day seemed easier than most. I knew some of it was mental, and I was happy the trip would soon be over, but it also seemed like a fairly easy climb. The map showed no crevasse danger as we were now basically above the glacier. For the first time, we didn't rope up, instead walking in a single file. Kim and I hadn't talked much since the previous morning, mostly because I was either off by myself or in my tent. I suspected the others were beginning to think I was a, a bit sullen, but I didn't care. After all, I hadn't signed up to go on their expedition. It was supposed to be just me and Chris. If our original plans had held, we probably would have been off the mountain a couple days ago. On we went, and soon thunders of clouds flew high above and small gusts of wind came in, reminding us to hurry. Chris and Kim and I were now climbing together, the other four some up behind as the three of us had a faster pace. Chris and Kim were behind me as I broke trail, and once again I could hear Chris again talking about himself, bragging. I shook my head in disgust and upped my pace until I was well ahead of them and finally out of sight. It was then that I realized how black my feelings towards Chris had become. He was talking to a woman I'd met in a bar, someone I barely even knew, who was maybe married, yet I was jealous. It was ridiculous. I needed to back off and get my head together. I suddenly felt fatigued, and I knew it was partly mental. I recalled drifting off to sleep in Haynes Junction, deciding not to climb Logan. I was beginning to wish I'd listened to myself. I would be home right now, sitting in my big recliner, maybe even watching something like the Andy Griffith show, which for some reason sounded really nice. I shook my head at the irony as I never watched anything, preferring to read instead. Before I knew it, I was on the summit of Mount Logan, standing at 19,551 feet. The view literally took my breath away, and a wind rose from far below, swirling snow around my feet, portent of the coming storm. I was the first of our group to summit, not that it meant anything to me, other than I could sit and rest for a bit while I waited for the others to catch up. 
I pulled a small tin holding hard candy from my pocket and fumbled with it, the wind trying to take it from my hands, then sat back on my heels and waited for the others. The winds were picking up by the moment, and I wished everyone would hurry up and get there so we could turn around and go back. The view was incredible, but it seemed lost on me as I just wanted to go down. In the meantime, I'd almost forgotten that I'd promised to leave something for a friend, a small Tibetan prayer flag. My good friend Joan had recently lost her husband in an avalanche in Alaska's Chichag Mountain, and she'd asked me to place a flag on Mount Logan in his memory. She felt that his spirit would be with us on our climb. I carefully unwrapped the flag from my pocket, then dug a hole with my ice axe in the snow under a nearby rock, stuffing the small flag in it so it wouldn't blow away. That probably wasn't what Joan had pictured, but it was the best I could do. That done, I could now see two figures coming through the swirling snow. It had to be Chris and Kim. I stood, my heavy pack still on my back, waiting for them to reach the summit. As they slowly approached, it was then that I saw the spider. It was unbelievable, but there was a black spider resting on top of the snow, and how the wind kept from blowing it away was beyond me. I bent down to look closer at it. It was alive. I took the small tin from my pocket, scooped the spider up, and carefully closed the lid, using my body to block the wind. I would take it back to my buddy the entomologist. Maybe he would have some idea how a spider got to the top of a 19,500-foot mountain surrounded by ice fields and lived to tell about it. For a moment, I felt bad, knowing that the spider was sure to die in the tin, feeling that I had tampered with nature. I wondered if the spider would be like the climber sitting in a nice cave in a whiteout, wondering if it would survive, knowing the odds were against it. But I also knew its chances of survival on the mountain were zero. I sat on my haunches, eyes closed. The wind was now starting to howl, and I knew my thinking was getting clouded. In fact, I'd forgotten all about Chris and Kim heading up the summit, I looked up to see both of them standing in front of me, looking down on me, backlit by the sun shining through the mist. It took a while, but I eventually realized it wasn't Chris and Kim. There were indeed others on the mountain. They had summited behind me, and I wondered why they'd chosen to wear black parkas and pants covered with long flowing hair, just like the figure I'd seen in the rocks, and why they seemed to loom over me so much bigger. Somehow my mind drifted into thinking that black would be a good choice for climbers, as it would soak up the heat. Maybe when I got back, I would suggest it to some gear company, and they would give me some kind of bonus for my clever discovery. Now the figures were talking to me, but I couldn't see their mouths move through the swirling snow. It felt like the sound was in my head, just like when Chris had been talking in his sleep. We know how tired you must be. Let us carry your pack down for you. I was moved by their concern, but I stubbornly hauled all that gear up the mountain and there was no way I would part with it. No, I'm fine, I replied. I felt like my words were being blown out to the Gulf of Alaska, and I wondered why I could barely hear myself through the wind, yet I could understand them so clearly. Now the other was speaking, his eyes glowing red, even in the bright sunlight. I wondered if he weren't going snow blind, and why he wasn't wearing goggles. It's a really long way up this mountain, he said, but we know of a quicker way down. If you go over to the edge with me, you can see down forever. There's deep snow down and it's very soft. If you jump, you'll save yourself having to trudge down thousands of feet. Others have done it and your friends can come and pick you up down there. Leave your pack here. You won't need it. And you'll go faster without it. It suddenly sounded like the perfect thing to do. I could get down quickly and soon be home, sitting in my recliner, had it gone drinking hot tea. I started for the edge, the two figures following behind, one lightly pulling on my pack as if he wanted to carry it for me. Now that I was standing near them, I marveled at how huge they were. Then, for some reason, Chris's words came back to me. We've all heard the stories, Buckaroo. It's mountain madness. It had you in its grip for a moment. Of course. The figures weren't real. I was hallucinating. If I listened to them, I would soon fall to my death. I turned quickly, laughing madly, pushing them aside and literally running to the summit just in time to see Chris and Kim walk up. I looked back. The two figures had disappeared. Mountain madness indeed. And I blanched at how close I'd come to falling prey to my own dementia. Chris had been right. His words had saved my life. I sensed something was wrong from the expression on their faces. Then Kim said 
we have to go back. Kurt getting pulmonary edema, and the others are trying to get him down quickly. I'm glad they're doctors and know what to do. He was somewhat in shock from the crevasse rescue. We shouldn't have let him continue, and now he's in a bad way. We need to follow them and be there when the plane arrives, especially with this storm coming in. They're trying to get out today, and we need to follow them. Pulmonary edema is one of the most common killers on Big Peak, filling your lungs with fluid, and yet it has a simple cure. Get the victim down to a lower altitude quickly. Often, by the time the victim reaches a lower altitude, they're completely recovered. We quickly hiked back down to the Summit Plateau camp and collected our tent and put on our skis as fast as we could. Kim's group was long gone, trying to get Kurt down quickly. We didn't catch up with them until almost at base camp, where they told us that Kurt had recovered enough after a few thousand feet that they were all able to make a time. They'd called on the sat phone and it wouldn't be long until the plane would come and take us away, though it could only haul only two at a time. I told everyone about my hallucination. I knew it had been a close call, and I thanked Chris for reminding me that one's senses didn't always see reality. He said nothing. It took the plane several trips to get us all out, and Chris and I were the last to go. Once back at the hangar along Kulane Lake, we looked incredibly haggard and tired. Everyone else had already been shuttled back to Haynes Junction by the time we got there, except Kim, who had dutifully waited for us. It was late by the time we got back to town, and as the shuttle dropped Kim off at the cabin they'd all rented, we said our goodbyes. I had mixed feelings, hating to see Kim pass from my life, yet happy to be off the mountain. Though we'd exchanged numbers, I knew the logistics were such that we'd probably never see each other again, and it did indeed turn out to be the last time I was in Canada. But I'll never forget the last thing Kim told me before getting off the shuttle. She looked at me and said, Those figures you hallucinated up there? They were real. Chris and I saw them. With that, she was gone, leaving my heart colder than it had been at the summit of that immense mass of itself. It's not far from Haynes Junction to Whitehorse, and the next day, Chris dropped me off at the airport there. I gave him enough gas money to get home, which I didn't mind as that had been part of the original deal. He didn't seem to care that I was bailing on him, and there wasn't much he could say anyways, especially when I told him that I was still suffering from mountain madness. He knew I was being sarcastic, as what I'd seen had really existed, yet I realized that he'd inadvertently saved my life, and I was appreciative. If I'd known that the figures at the top of Mount Logan were real, I think they could have persuaded me to jump, given my fatigue. As I sat, waiting at the White House airport, I remembered the small tin and took it out from my pocket to see if the spider had survived. Amazingly, it had, so I went outside and set it free in some nearby bushes. I didn't have the heart to see it die. Its ordeal was over, just as mine was. We would both hopefully end up someplace better than we'd been. I was soon back home in Missoula, where I was ready to settle down and repilot my future, which I knew wouldn't have any climbing expeditions in it. Like I'd figured, I never saw him again, though Chris did. I knew he would take his time getting back as he had no choice driving that slow bus, but I didn't think he would end up spending three months in Edmonton. He'd followed Kim home like a little puppy, and though they became friends, that was the extent of it, as I think she'd seen enough on the mountain to know she didn't want to get involved with him. He eventually came back to Montana, but only after he'd had to sell the old bus for travel money, which neither of us considered much of a loss. He'd hitched a ride back with some young dirtbag climbers who I'm sure he regaled with all his wild stories. I've often wondered if he told the one about mountain madness on Mount Logan. Chris still sleeps on my porch occasionally, which I don't mind, though I do worry about him more since his hair is now showing some gray, and he seems to be getting more and more arthritic, which I'm sure his drinking doesn't help. We're still friends, though not as close. And I find I have more patience for his shenanigans than I once did, yet I feel more detached from him. I'm selling my house and going back to the Sierras, and I hope he does okay without me. He stopped climbing, which he says is because he's too stiff. I know this is true, but there's more. He says he's worried about mountain madness, and that something bad might happen to him. I just let it go. He knows the truth as well as I do. He knows I didn't have mountain madness, but... He doesn't want to admit that there's something out there he can't explain. It's just too scary.
I hope you enjoyed those encounters. And if you did, be sure to hit that like button, leave a comment, and subscribe. I post new content every single day, so be sure to hit that notification bell, and you'll be notified exactly when that new content arrives on my channel. Again, thank you so much, and until next time, bye!